but Randy is the founder uh, and director of Eternal Perspective Ministries. And this is a nonprofit that's dedicated to biblical teaching, uh, sound biblical teaching, and to also bringing uh, the cause of the poor into the forefront to those folks in that context. Uh, you know him well. He's a New York Times bestseller, written over 55 books, uh, including Heaven, The Treasure Principle, uh, Safely Home, uh, translated, his books have been translated into 70 different languages, over 11 million copies sold. Pretty amazing. Um, he's active on social media. You would see him all the time. Uh, you don't have to go too far on your television dial. Dial? Is there still dials? No, there's no dials. <laughs> you don't have to go too far. You don't have to go too far on your television remote or, or, or on, your, on your radio uh, to find him on a, on, a, on a television show or being interviewed on radio, that kind of thing. He lives in Gresham, Oregon with his wife, Nancy, and they have a golden retriever named Maggie. Uh, and they have two married daughters and five grandchildren. So uh, please, please, please give a warm, compassionate welcome to both Stacy Foster and Randy Alcorn. Man, I'm excited and privileged and honored to be able to interview you. Probably for 22 years, I mean, I've been vicariously mentored and taught and instructed, and I can honestly say I've stolen some of your stuff, but I gave you credit. <laughs> I gave you credit. Uh, but you are a voice to this generation. There are many people who are echoed, but you're a voice. And as was mentioned, 55 books, you've written over 55 books. I've read four of those. <laughs> More recently, I've got a lot of catching up to do. More recently, you've written Giving is the Good Life. So we want to talk about that and dig into that. So to ask your question, your, your book is entitled Giving is the Good Life. How does scripture define the good life? And how is that different than the world's definition? Well, let's start with the world's definition. The good life, when people talk about it, if you look up the good life online, it's pretty much make as much money as you can, spend as much as you can on yourself, go anywhere you want to go and do anything you want to do, and that's the good life. Um, however, even in the world, when people do that, they hit these dead-end streets or cul-de-sacs and end up going nowhere. I remember a few years ago, it was a major magazine where um, Owen Wilson, the actor, had attempted to um, take his life. And uh, there, people were saying, well, wait a minute, he has everything. He has everything the rest of us wants. He's, he's, got, he's got all this money and all the fame and the popularity and the power and the influence and the relationships and all of this, except that really wasn't the good life. You know how we know that for sure? Because if you're living the good life, you don't want to end your life. Yeah. Now, Jesus said, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Uh, Jesus said he is the life. He calls himself the bread of life. He's the living water. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the resurrection and the life. And he has come to bring us life and bring it more abundantly. He's all about life. And uh, Compassion's ministry related to bringing physical life and spiritual life to people. This, what's the good life? Well, the good life biblically is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. And when you live that kind of life, among other things, it's happy making. Jesus said it is more happy making to give than to receive. Um, the, the word uh, that's uh, translated um, blessed usually is uh, makarius, a Greek word that means happiness or happy or happy making. And so the good life is a happy life. The problem is we sometimes look for the good life in the wrong places and we look for happiness in the wrong places. And that's why uh, I wrote the book, Giving is the Good Life, because I just want to clarify what Scripture actually says. It's so beautiful and so hope-giving. 
And the good life is not what people claim it is. It's something, well, it's what Jesus claimed it was. Absolutely. Someone once said that um, prosperity without purpose leads to self-indulgence. Mm. And so I think that that's often what we see. Tell me, how does your book connect with the Ministry of Compassion International? Well, um, we have, uh, when our girls were very small, and they would say they were probably five and seven, it might have even been a little bit before that, um, we started sponsoring Compassion Kids from different parts of the world. And I, they are now, uh, my oldest daughter just turned 40, and uh, my younger daughter is, our younger daughter is 38. And Nancy, and my wife Nancy and I, 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 we don't remember a time where we didn't have pictures and letters from Compassion Kids on our refrigerator. Um, and of course, as you know, we, we often go to the refrigerator. And so there, <laughs> there they are. And, and the, the joy of receiving these letters and the translations and the, you know, and then writing back and our kids did this for years. Um, you know, so there's, there's this great connection there. Um, uh, the, um, the 11 million copies of the books that have sold, uh, all the royalties uh, from those books, are, uh, Nancy and I, by God's grace, have been able to give away. Uh, and um, many of those, uh, much of those funds ha has gone to different places in the world for issues of hygiene and education and uh, clean water uh, and all the kinds of things that... Uh, that compassion is about. So we've supported compassion, but we've also supported many other organizations and uh, also uh, Bible translation, uh, world evangelism, church planning. And even when I walked in, this was the first time I had been to uh, compassion. Um, when I walked in and I saw the verses that were up there, I thought I could not think of better verses. And of course, uh, the beautiful um, statues, you know, of related to, probably not called statues, but whatever they are, uh, but related to uh, Jesus and the children uh, and even a dog. And I'm going, this is so great because God made this world and he loves people and he loves animals. And of course, animals don't have souls in the sense that people do, but God cares about the world he's made. So I just feel like we, our hearts are aligned, our core values uh, are aligned with compassion. And it was really a privilege for me to uh, write this book and to uh, draw attention through it to the Ministry of Compassion and many, many other uh, worthy organizations as well. You know, and I don't want us to miss the moment. You, you just said that you've sold over 11 million books and all of the royalties have gone back into kingdom ministry. I think we ought to celebrate that, guys. You know, I had, uh, I had somebody say to me, I've actually had a couple of people say this, it's, do you know what you could do with all that money from all those books? And my response, and, and, and it was genuine the first time I said it, and it's genuine now, is nothing that would bring us nearly as much joy as has come to us. And yes, also purpose and helping other people and loving your neighbor as yourself but everybody benefits with the giving. It's not just the recipient who benefits, it's the giver. Well, say, say a little more about how this has given or transformed your life and your family's life. Well, you know, as, as our kids were growing up, uh, I remember one particular time uh, where, um, there's a long story behind it, I won't get into it, but for years, for 20 years, uh, we needed to make a minimum wage because of uh, being involved in um, peaceful, nonviolent civil disobedience at abortion clinics where we were just speaking up for those who could not speak for themselves, and that's just one of the areas in pro-life ministry. Well, as a result of that, uh, our kids grew up in a family where we didn't make a lot of money, but God always provided. But I remember one time being out with uh, my daughter, Angela, 
my younger daughter, when she was a junior in high school, and we were riding our bikes. We were just riding around the neighborhood in Gresham, Oregon, which is a suburb of Portland. Uh, greetings, by the way, from Portland, Oregon, world capital of weirdness. Um, <laughs> no, we, we love Portland, but wow. <laughs> Woo. Anyway, so, uh, so uh, we're, we're riding our bikes around, and we, uh, we came into this uh, gated community. Well, we, we don't have gated communities in that area at all, none. And so we go, this is an actual gate here. So naturally, since there was a gate, we went around it on the bikes. <laughs> and then we're riding bike, and there's this new housing development. And there's one house that hasn't been sold, and it's the most beautiful, it's just an incredible house. And v view of Mount Hood, and, and it was probably easily... 6,000 square feet, something like that. And we're looking at it, and Angie is like, Dad, is that an amazing house? And, and uh, all the landscaping and all that. And then I looked at the, the sign, how much it would cost to buy this house. Now, I know in some parts of the country, like my friends in Southern California, um, th there's a lot of houses that sell for $500,000, but that's what it was selling for and, and not houses nearly as great as this. But in our area, a $500,000 home is just unbelievable. So I, I, I just suddenly dawns on me. I, I, I look at Angela, I said, well, Angie, you know what we do with all the royalties and you know all the ministries we give them to and helping people and helping children and all that. And I said, so if we would have kept the book royalties just from the last year, we would have been able to pay cash for that house. She says, no kidding? And then I said, so do you wish we would have? And she looked at me and she smiled. She says, dad, it's just a house. Yeah, and, I go, yeah. and I thought, you know, our children didn't suffer. So. Yeah, great story. So in your book, in, you, you highlight 1 Timothy chapter 6 and you give us some bad news about money, stewardship, and giving. Yeah, so there's bad news and good news. First Timothy 6 is a remarkable chapter because you've got all of the uh, condemnation for the rich passages. James 5, you know, weep and howl, you rich, for the miseries that are coming upon you. Uh, uh, wow. Uh, then you got the Old Testament prophets, and then you'd go, go to globalrichlist.com and just put in your annual income, and then you'll be shocked at where you are. You might be in the 98th percentile. You, there's a good chance you're in the 99th percentile. Uh, right now, the uh, poverty level for a family of four in the U.S. is $25,000, and I haven't looked at it uh, recently, but last time I looked at it, I think it was in the upper 97th or lower 98th percentile of wealth in the entire world, and, and, and it's poverty level. And I don't mean there's no poverty in America. I'm not saying that, and things are relative. I get that. But, but, but my point is that when we read Scripture talking to the rich, that's us. You know, so you would be hard-pressed to not find people that would qualify as that, because even if you uh, are in the 95th percentile, that's relatively rich in the world, right? 95th percentile, that's very high. And, uh, and you, that's not much money that qualifies to be rich in that sense. So when Scripture talks about rich, riches and desiring to be riches, uh, to have riches, it's talking about us. And here's what it says in... Um, 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10. I was talking with Stacy about this uh, this morning where, you know, you could not pile more negatives into two verses. Listen to this. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that Plunge, and, and the word that's translated plunge is, is a, the common word for drowning, that, that drown people in ruin and destruction. So now, that's, I mean, we're already at about 
10 bad things that happen to you. And that's just one verse, verse 9. And then it's followed with verse 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have. So it's evil, root of evil. Uh, Money is not evil, of course, but uh, the love of money is a root of all evil. And it's through this craving that some have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So if your goal in life is to be pierced with many griefs and be overcome by evil uh, and to face ruin and destruction, to drown, to get involved in senselessness, temptation, snares, and harmful desires, if that's your goal, then you should desire to be rich. Wow. How does that even, wow. I mean, that, that's pretty bad news. And like James 5 is pretty bad news. Indeed, that is bad news. Well, what is the good news? Yeah, the good news. <laughs> the, oh, we don't have time for the good news. No. No, the, but here's the beautiful thing. I think we need to let this grip us because then something astounding happens uh, and, and the verses in between connect to a certain extent where it talks in verse 15, um, the, talking about God who is the happy and only sovereign. That's that word makarios again. It's happy. He who is the happy and only sovereign, King of kings, Lord of lords. And then verses 17 through 19, right when you pretty much have lost hope as a rich person, right? I mean, relatively rich in the world. Is there any way out of this, these dreadful consequences of desiring to be rich and to having wealth? Well, here it is, verse 17. As for the rich in this present age, again, almost all of us that are here, relatively speaking. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be prideful, haughty, nor to set their hopes on, not to be like, hey, I pulled myself up by my bootstraps. And, you know, often it's that, that old thing about, you know, you were uh, born with a, uh, born on third base and you think you hit a triple, you know, type of thing. Um, but not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, because you can't trust riches. They're just, they're, they're just uncertain. But to put your hope in God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Now, that's amazing. God richly provides us with everything to enjoy. It's okay to enjoy a, a fun thing or a good thing or a good meal. And that's reassuring, but then verse 18, they are to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and ready to share. Okay? Thus storing up what for themselves? Treasures for themselves. Just like Jesus said in Matthew 6, don't store for yourselves treasures on earth. Moth and rust and corrupt and these break in and steal. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven because that's the right thing to do. Well, sure, it's the right thing to do. But Jesus' argument is do it because it's the smart thing to do. And don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth because not just because it's the wrong thing to do, but because it's the stupid thing to do. Because those treasures aren't going to last. You are going to be parted from your treasures. Either your treasures are taken from you or you are taken for your treasures when we, from all of us, when we leave this world. But storing up, thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the coming age, heaven. When we're with Jesus, the resurrection, living with him on the new earth, so that, so that what? Well, so that, okay, we're going to have to make a bunch of sacrifices in this life, and we'll be miserable here, but one day it'll all pay off in eternity. No, that's not what it says. A good foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. That's present tense not in the future, 
take hold of here and now the life that is truly life, the good life, not the false life, not the, oh, do all this and got to have all this wealth and you got to hang on to it. No, what he says is give it and give generously. And when you do that, you will have rewards from God in the coming age. And you will have the present satisfaction of knowing you're helping needy people and loving your neighbor as yourself. And on top of that, you will take hold of the life that is truly life. That is an astounding promise. You would have thought he would say, tell those who are rich in this world to do what? Give it all away and not be rich anymore. And, and of course, I, I think relatively speaking, there are certain situations in which we need to uh, divest ourselves of lar the larger amount of wealth that we may have if a lot has come our way. And it's the old thing of, um, you know, God shovels it in and I shovel it back and God has a bigger shovel. It's R.G. Letourneau who said that when he was giving away ultimately 90% of his business to the Lord. One of the things that's so fun about um, giving is the good life is all the stories I was able to tell in there that include Laterno and Stanley Tam and, and actually people all over the world. Actually, what, what's so amazing about this book is not only is it so laden with scripture, but the stories are amazing. Mm -hmm. I found myself being encouraged, being inspired, being corrected and rebuked at times. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned... I had you in mind, Stacy, when I, I wrote it. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. <laughs> Why do we need to understand that God's warning to the rich apply to us? You sort of alluded to it a little bit. Well, yeah, be, just because um, it, I think it's easy for us to look at passages of Scripture and go, well, that's not talking to me. And so people start thinking, well, when the Bible's talking about the rich, it's not talking to me. To me. Well, again, globalrichlist.com. Look it up, put it in there, and you'll never, ever think that you're poor again. So, Randy, you say that uh, in your book, you say giving can infuse the Christian life with a sense of adventure. In what way? Well, you know, this is the thing. I think so many people lack joy. They lack a happiness in Jesus. They, they lack uh, a purpose for their life. And they lack adventure in their life. And I think anyone who is a Christian who is living a boring life is not really living the abundant life. And I think uh, part of that, what it makes it a, uh, an adventure is um, I pray when I sit down on a plane. I had three different people on um, airplanes yesterday. I was able to give a, a book or a booklet to and have a conversation with about the Lord. Um, only one case would I call it full out evangelism. The other couple of cases just, hey, you know, nice conversation and here's something you might be interested in. Um, in the hotel last night, and this morning, there's, there's just little connections that you have with people. And that to me is just exciting because we're going to hear those stories someday. We're going to sit um, at the banquets and uh, Luke 14 says, invite the poor and the lame and the crippled in, help all of these people and they will not reward you, but you will be rewarded at the resurrection of the righteous. And we will see some of these needy people, but also just nor normal people that we bump into on a daily basis uh, and, and, Randy, and you, had a role in their life. You, you tell a story in your book about a guy named John as it relates to the great adventure. Would you mind unpacking that a little bit and just sort of... Sure. Yeah. yeah um, so this was uh, last uh, summer, not, not the summer we just finished, but... Last summer is a really uh, hot day, and uh, I have this, um, it's, a, it's a Walgreens that's not far from our house that I'll often just drop in and get something very quickly, and it, I'm in and out. So uh, when I go into this place, it, it often has, you know, sometimes you'll see a homeless person or you'll see people that are just kind of huddling close for warmth or shelter or something like that. 
Uh, and uh, so I, I pray when I go in that God would just connect me with somebody and there might be somebody in need that I could buy something for him or offer somebody or talk to him about the Lord. And I always have uh, booklets that I've written, most of them Tyndale House booklets. And I, I bring, you know, I have those with me. And so this particular time, I felt like the Lord wanted me to go in there. And I, my main purpose was actually to get a Diet Mountain Dew. But then when I saw it was $1.89 for 20 ounces, you know, I was just a little too cheap for that. And so I walk back out and I go, okay, Lord, I don't see anybody. I walk out and here is this guy who has just kind of appeared out of nowhere. He wasn't there, you know, 60 seconds earlier when I'd come in, and he's, um, he's probably early 30s, he's got a beard, uh, long hair, he's wearing sandals, you might start to get a feel for things at this point. And so I think, okay, this is the guy I wanna to talk to, a very worn, uh, weathered face. So, so I come up to him and I say, hi, um, uh, my name's, uh, my name's Randy, what's your name? He says, my name's John, and then he looks at me, and he says, uh, are you a servant of Yeshua Adonai? Uh, Hebrew words for Jesus, the Lord. And I said, I am, are you? And he said, I am, let me pray for you. He puts his hand on my shoulder, and you know, so I'm thinking I'm the one that's going to have a ministry to this guy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and he prays the most wonderful, eloquent prayer I had ever heard. And he, and he, Lord, I pray that you would use Randy and do mighty works in his life and show him your faithfulness. And, and you know, he didn't know my wife had been diagnosed with cancer. He didn't know, he didn't know what was going on in my life or maybe he did know what was going on in my life, but the Lord knew and sent this person to me. So I, I, I did say to him, okay, well, after he's done praying for me, I said, hey, come on in, let me get you, let me get you water. So I go over and he, he, take, he picks a small water and I pick a large water and I grab it and it's right next to the Diet Mountain, too, Mountain Dew. I was too cheap to, to buy, but then I take this and I said, can I get you something to eat? Oh yeah, how about some healthy chips over here? And, and so I get the chips and then I, we go and, and for, I don't know, I, I can't remember how much it costs. I, I think I have it in the book, but $4 and something or whatever. And, and I think, you know, that $4 and something was uh, possibly one of the best investments I've ever made. Um, because when we went back outside, he smiled, he thanked me, he shook my hand, and I thanked him for praying for me, but he just turned and, and walked away. And I went in, I went to my car, and I just started crying, and just going, Lord, you, you ministered to me. And whether this was an angel, which I suspect it probably was, or whether it's um, John, did, did the Lord send the Apostle John? Or was it Jesus, <laughs> Jesus himself coming down? And, but whatever it was, there was something supernatural. But if you've prayed with homeless people before, you know that's not what you usually get. And this guy was like he's anointing me and, you know, all of this. It was pretty amazing. But then I drove off about 10 minutes later, and then I look over at a, at a Petco, and here, here, here's John drinking that big bottle of water, and, lean, and he looks at me, and he goes like this, like, see you later. And I really believe I will see him later, you know? I know I'll see him later, because whether it was a brother in Christ, a human being, whether it was an angel, or whether it was Jesus, uh, I'll, I'll see him again. Yeah. What a wonderful story. I mean, and the book is laden with stories like that. What is your hope for those that will read Giving Us the Good Life? Well, I hope that it will revolutionize people's lives and give them an excitement about the Christian life, uh, give them the happiness that there is in giving. There are so many people who just, there's, there are a lot of secular people who have caught on to the joy of giving, whereas there are a lot of Christians and certainly a lot of professing Christians who just have not caught it. 
They just don't get it. They're all, always just thinking in terms of duty and obligation and I can't afford to even tithe. I can't afford to do this or whatever. Tithing's not the, I mean, tithing to me is, is the floor of giving. It's not the, the ceiling, you know. It's, it's a great place to start, but then keep going. Uh, and not everybody can, but a lot of people can. And so to me, I just hope that people will just broaden their sense of surrounded by a world of need, but that doesn't have to depress you, though sometimes, as you all well know, it will make your heart very, very heavy, and rightly so. But then to be able to get in there and do something about it, and to see the joy you're bringing other people and to experience the joy of your own life. That's what I hope people will experience. And there's so many missions-related stories in the book, so many international stories um, that I hope it will also just widen a lot of people's vision yeah. for God's kingdom. People of every tribe, nation, and language, you know what that's all about at uh, Compassion, and thank you for what you do. It, it has meant a lot to me, and it's meant a lot to, obviously, children and adults everywhere in the world. And uh, by the way, the joy that you were experiencing with all the applause for your, you know, people being honored with the anniversary of their employment and all that, that's just, I mean, you, are, you clearly are getting it is more happy making to give than to receive. And yeah. I commend you for that. Yeah, Randy, man, we, we really appreciate you and, and what you're doing and helping us to be reminded that there's an eternal perspective that we have to have. And Randy doesn't just talk to talk. He, here's what is so amazing about him. Uh, he's such a generous man. He's given away 11 million copies, or excuse me, the royalties from over 11 million books. And today, he's given each one of us a copy of Giving is the Good Life. I Would think you? Tyndale gets the credit for that, but, well, 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 let me say, Randy wrote it, and Ron is giving it away. <laughs> yeah, and it's all coming out of Ron's salary, too. So, <laughs> so why don't you give uh, another hand to Randy and our friends from Tyndale. And can we, in this last moment, we want to pray for you. Can you stand? Can you stand? And we just want to pray that God's hand of favor and blessing and protection would be upon Randy and his wife, Nancy, and as they continue to do the work that God has given them to do. Father, thank you. Thank you for this man of God. Thank you for this brother. Father, I pray that you would do exceeding abundantly above all that he could ask, think, or even imagine according to the power that's at work in him. I pray, Lord God, that you would just let your hand of favor be upon him, Lord God. You say you surround the righteous with favor as a shield. Let that be his portion, Lord God. We thank you and we bless you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.